Okay, we're starting another chainsaw video here. This is my little McCulloch uh, Mac, I believe they call it. Yeah, the Mac 3516. As you can see, I got a lot of sorting out to do here. Here is my original saw, which I tore this thing apart about eight years ago, right about the time that I um, bought the Poland. We just got running, and the reason that was the reason I bought the Poland because um, this thing needed a sprocket. The oil tank for the chain oiler leaked real bad, and I uh, found out that when I went to the chainsaw or small engines place, they said that McCulloch went out of business. Which is very disappointing. I think McCulloch makes a very nice saw. But um, this thing had no running issues. It had a sprocket that I could not find. I eventually did. I found one decent used one. My original sprocket was eaten up beyond use. There it is. As you can see, I found one decent used one. And I do have a new one, too. I found it on the you can find some used parts for these, uh, at least on eBay, I know, and maybe someplace. Some small parts houses still have some stuff on the shelf. I don't know if they still make anything for them, but... And I also, when I, here's my new oil tank. Right there, 16 bucks. Found that just last week. I just kind of forgot about looking for parts for it. It's just been in the attic for 12 years, so... We got to remember how this thing goes together. As you can see, I got it completely torn apart. I need to clean it up really good too. And here's a wrap. I bought a whole box of parts too. And I did eventually find a new sprocket, like I said. Okay, there's another one that's not as good as I thought. It's no better than one of it, but yes, I did find a new one right there. Actually, that used one, which I thought was better than my old one, is not better than my old one. Ah, here, okay. There we go. Ah, I know what I did. I just threw the uh, one I just showed you from that box in this box. This is the same one I just showed you. Here is the used ones, which was a little better. Actually, quite a bit better. At least it's usable. It don't look great. We'll keep it as a spare. But it's better than the original one that got completely eat up. I guess if a guy wanted to, he could weld that up. Something I always thought about trying, welding it up and machine it back down in my mill. Yeah, which is something I have to do when you have an old saw that there are no parts for. But um, before I get too deep into making a video on this, this is just the introduction of it. I need to clean all my parts up and remember how it goes together and see if I do have everything. Uh, if I need some more of that small fuel line, I'll have to order that. So um, we'll pause this thing and get all my parts cleaned up and continue this video. Maybe not, probably not today. Okay, now it's Saturday, exactly one week from when this video began, when I showed you the uh, whole box of dirty, greasy parts. Well, we, I've been spending two or three days of last week figuring out what goes where and cleaning parts. And Actually, I did get it together last night, and I actually got it running this morning. But I still wanted to do a video to show how the assembly of this thing goes. And... Um, so I took it back apart so I can show you. So we're kind of cheating in this video. You're not going to be seeing me hunt around and search for parts, hopefully. I'm sure I'll forget something, even though I just tore this apart ten minutes ago. But I uh, <clears throat> just want to show you how this McCulloch chainsaw goes back together. <clears throat> One thing I'm going to leave out. Excuse me, I'm a little congested. I may leave this little um, safety doodad out. Some people might not approve of that. I don't know. I might put this back on goes like this right here. I don't know how well you can see that. I don't know. That's not too hard to put on. So if you can see that. Get this right here. I didn't have it on. And I was wondering whether I should um, figure out how to do it on video or not. Yeah, all it is, it just fits in there like that. And when you push down on it, you can pull the trigger. Okay. Where to start? Let's see. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is show you how to put the oil pump on. First, you, I'm not going to pull this piece off. See this little threaded worm gear looking thing here and the spring slides on top of it? Because that little 1 16th keyway there is a real pain in the butt to take off. And uh, Actually, my original one was sheared. I don't know how it got sheared. I think 
I probably did it taking it apart. That might have been why I put the saw away up in the attic and bought another one. But uh, as luck would have it, my box of spare parts, I did buy a bunch of parts for this back when I first attempted to work on it 10 to 12 years ago. Uh, they had a lot of good hardware all bagged up and everything, and that really come in helpful. So when you have a saw like this that is obsolete and they're out of business, it's good to uh, look for parts saws on eBay. I'm seeing them on there for 25 bucks, so I'm tempted to get another one for parts. But anyway, like I said, they had the hardware, and they had this little keyway, which I could not find on the Internet, so I got lucky. It's a 1 16th thick keyway. I had to make a little chisel, which I don't think is anywhere around here, so I can show it to you to get a broken keyway out with. But I had to use a dowel pen, and I sharpened it. Here it is right here. I had to use a dowel pen and I sharpened it into a little chisel. And that, I pretty much had to do like that and hit it with a hammer and get it out of there. And it wasn't easy to get out. And it was all burned up and I took a little eighth inch carbide end mill, which you see me use a bigger end mills on my Bridgeport mill. And I used it to deburr the keyway out so I could beat this thing in there. But anyway, that's why I'm not taking a worm gear off is because I'm not taking that keyway back off. But, first of all, our tank just slides right in that little slot right there. And since we already have a spring, I already have my uh, oil line going in. There's a little filter down in there, which goes on the end of the oil line. And this is much, this right here, this pump, is pretty much like my pollen saw. It's got a little plastic gear. This one looks like it's okay, so I'm going to use it. Remember on my polling, the plastic gear was stripped out. I don't know if that's a common problem with these, but um, I'd say this was just as fragile. But you got two screws. Go right there. Um, I'm using a little, a little star or a torx bit as they call them. All, most of the screws on these saws, you can use your star torx bit. And they also have a slot for a flathead screwdriver. So. In some situations, you need to use the screwdriver. Actually, there's one situation where I need a really long screwdriver when I get the case together on this. But, pump just goes on like that. And I want to make sure I didn't get it in a bind there. And spin my little crankshaft, and it's fine. And the last screw, actually, well, we messed up. Hang on. We don't put these two screws in. We put in one screw. Got it ass backwards there. We put one screw in the middle mounting hole first, screw hole. Now I gotta take that one back out because my fuel tank goes over top of this. Everything laid out, so hopefully this video will be kind of smooth. But anyway, that tank just lays over top like that, and then the screws go through the tank and through the pump and into the little engine block there. But before I do that, I got me a brand new filter. I had when I got it running, had some issues with carburetor adjustment, just like with the polling. I ended up taking the um, Taking the plastic guards off of the adjustment screws and I was able to adjust it. That's something else I want to show you. Anyway, that little filter goes on there. And this line goes in through the tank right here. And it goes to the feed line of your carburetor. Something else you want to look at on these carburetors if you've got an old one. If you take that screw right there off, that little plate will come off and there's a filter screen where your fuel goes in. Sometimes that can get full of dirt too, especially if your fuel line, like on my Poland did, gets all hard and cracked and falls off and you're running it without a filter. So you, yes, you can get sawdust down in there in your fuel and it'll end up clogging that little screen on your carburetor. But you gotta cram this little filter down there where it'll lay on the bottom. I think I'm gonna need to pull this line through so that it's gonna allow my filter. Right now it's in a bind. There it goes. So now I gotta Take my needle nose pliers and I'm going to pull that line back through. You want that, you want enough line to be in that tank to where that filter can lay on the bottom when your saw is upright. 
And also enough to where when you're turning yourself sideways, your filter will lay on the bottom with, or on the side of the tank. Just and that's that's how a saw when that's working right. That's how a saw can run upside down or whatever position you need to run it in. So now we got that. Now we have another fuel line we need to run in this tank. It's for the primer bulb. This goes to the pump side of the primer bulb, which is mounted to the case. And I already got one line. That line goes to the carburetor. And I'm, you're probably not going to be able to see this, and I don't know where my flashlight is. Now here it is. If you look, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see this on camera or not, but if you look, on the fitting that the line goes in, you see there's two little fuel line fittings on that little primer bulb. This is the back side of the bulb. It'll say N on it. I don't, can't really see it unless you was right here looking at it really close. But that is the side, that the feed side, or that the uh, line that goes into the tank goes to. It'll be, actually I was telling you wrong. I knew I'd screw up something on this video, but actually it's the fitting without the line on is what I meant to say. That is the inside, which means it comes from the tank. That's the part when you prime, push the primer bulb, it pulls gas out of the tank, through the bulb, out this line, and into your carburetor. Just wanted to show you that. So we're going to take this piece of fuel line, and this is something I showed you on a pole, and when you, when you feed these lines through these little holes in the tanks, it's a really tight fit, and the easiest way to do it is cut it on an angle like that, and that will help you be able to push that line, get that line started through that hole, and once you get a little bit of it pushed through the tank, you can reach down in there with needle nose pliers and just do that. And that's what's always worked best for me. And you want that primer bulb line sticking out enough to where it can go down kind of deep in the tank. That way your tank has, doesn't have to be completely full or half full in case you need to prime it. One thing I've never understood, you're probably wondering why isn't there a filter on that? That's a good question because um, every saw I've taken apart never had a filter on the primer bulb line which still ends up in the carburetor. You would think they both should have it. I'm not sure how well the primer bulb would pull fuel into the carburetor with the filter because those filters are kind of restrictive. Something else you've got to watch is when you go to put the whole case together like this is there is a slot for these lines to fit in. You got to make sure they're in those slots because you can pinch your lines shut when you put your case together. And that's something it's kind of a pain in the rear end to do. You got to be careful and take your time and not get mad at it when you go to put it all together. And we'll see how smooth that goes when I go to put all this together. But anyway, I'm looking for, I think these two screws right here go on top of the tank. Yeah, these are actually machine threaded screws. And you got two different types of screws to hold your saw together. These, these kind of look like a wood screw type thread. They're, they're what hold your plastic pieces together, but you can have some that have an actual machine thread. Make sure you use the right screws on the right hose because uh, you don't really want to force the uh, wood screw type thread into a uh, tap thread. Whereas the wood screw type thread kind of makes its own threads in plastic or on wood. But we've got our tank secured in here. And I think next we need to get our flywheel on. And one thing I wanted to show you before I put all this together and get that flywheel on and covers everything up is I'm going to show you how I went about taking the um, plastic guard or locks off of the um, carburetor so you can adjust your carburetor. I had to do a lot of adjustment on this 
carburetor to get this one running right too, even though I thought it was running okay when I a long time ago, but maybe it wasn't. But um, actually, I had when after I made my adjustments. Here's your adjustment screws on hit this. You got your high and your low, and it's labeled on these McCullochs. See, that's going to fit over there like that. So your top one is your high, and your bottom one is your low, and the high one. It affects your idle and your low affects your um, throttle response and full throttle performance on it. And okay, we're going to show you the plastic piece. I got those up here, as you can see. I had to tear them up. And I'm going to this here was a lot harder to get off of than my Poland. My Poland, I was able just to pull the caps off the tops of the adjustment screws. Now this, before I took it off fit over top of these and how it went the springs were inside of here and you would to remove this you have to take some pliers and tear these red locks up one was a red one was a white and they kind of fit in there like that that's the way it was I should have done a video on how to just remove these on when I, while I had the carburetor off of it but you got to pull them out. as you can see I tore them up don't worry about tearing them up just make sure you don't get too rough and bend your adjustment screws or something. Once you get those out, you got to screw your adjustment screws all the way out to where they come out of the carburetor. And then you, you'll be able, when you get both of them, you'll be able to lift it all the way off, get your screws out of there, and then you put it back together like you see I got there. You just put your spring in. There's two little bitty washers for each screw. One goes under the spring, the other one goes on top of the spring. And that's how you get rid of these, uh, I guess I call them emission locks. They are a lot of newer lawnmowers and weed eaters and chainsaws and stuff have them on there so you can't adjust your carburetor. It's adjusted for emissions and they work when everything's brand spanking new but when everything wears in they need to be readjusted, readjusted and so on and so forth. Much like a car. Especially back in the 80s when they was getting strict with the uh, emissions and cars still had carburetors. Remember, those stock carburetors ran like crap. Anyway, this fits over here. We'll go ahead and put... No, no, I, don't, I need to put that on the final ball. Never mind. I was getting ahead of myself. And let's see, got a right-handed, a right-handed, white th hand threaded nut goes on this. I'm going to snug this down. And if any of you watched my uh, Poland saw video, I'm going to show you how to use the rope to keep from, keep your engine from spinning when you're tightening down stuff on the crank. Some people like to take screwdrivers and lock them in there and hold it in here or something on these teeth. You can break these fragile little teeth off. But, like I said in my polling video, uh, I watched this. I, I got this off of another guy's YouTube channel. He showed a neat little trick to keep these little engines still while you tighten it up. You take your rope, you find your stick a flashlight down in there or you could stick a screwdriver down in that piston hole which is right here or spark plug hole I meant to say and you bring your piston all the way down I'm just watching my piston move up and down and just feed that rope down in the spark plug hole get as much as you can in you don't have to completely cram it it doesn't really take much You kind of keep turning it so it kind of feeds itself in there. This is being kind of stubborn getting in there, but there it goes. Stick some in there, and what that does, when you turn this over, the piston comes up against that rope, and it keeps everything locked still so you can tighten it good and tight. And it doesn't hurt anything because that rope is soft. And when you want to get the rope out, just back the piston down a little bit, and out it comes. And we'll, and that's also needs to be done when you take your uh, 
pick your clutch sprocket and take it off and put it back on. And uh, never use your starter, when you're removing the clutch, never use your starter to hold the flywheel still because you got little plastic paws and if that nut's really, really tight on the other side, you'll break these plastic paws and they are no fun to put on. I had these off and uh, I did put them on. I'm not going to include that in the video because they are very hard to get on and make them work right. You got little bitty washers or the springs that go around them and they're not fun. So if you don't have to, don't take those little paws off the flywheel. Okay, now we got that tight. So now we need to put our cover on. First thing we want to do is we're going to hook our fuel line from the tank to the primer bulb. It's kind of hard to see. I'm going to set this part down like this. Put that in. And then you got this other line coming out of the primer bulb into this side of the carburetor. I don't know how well you're going to be able to see that. But it goes to that little fuel line fitting there. It's a smaller diameter tube that goes to that too. It just goes there. Like that. And then you got your kill switch. Here. One of them goes, I don't think it matters which goes where. Uh, all it does is connect and disconnect your circuit. So you just press these little tabs on like this. And here's your other one. Try to turn this around where you can hopefully see it. Slide it on like that. That one doesn't fit too awful tight. There it goes. It went all the way on. Now this part can be kind of irritating. Remember how I told you you got to pay attention that you don't crimp your fuel lines and you just kind of start working it on there. Don't force it. Make sure all your wires, I see two little slots here where my wires should go through. That kind of helps to find that out. Okay, it's starting to go back together. It snaps in here. Alright, that went together a lot easier. And you know what I didn't do? I did. My little safety switch is not where it should be. Okay, I'm gonna pull this back off. Now that goes like that. There we go. I have that like that. If you can even see what I'm doing. your flashlight, make sure your fuel lines are not crimped. They're in the slots that they put in the case for you. Make sure your carburetor link is working good as you're working this thing together. And I do see a wire that is kind of being pinched. We didn't hurt it, but we don't want to tighten all our screws together on the case those wires being pinched, you got to make sure it is in that little slot so it doesn't get pinched. There it goes. And, you can, and this thing, there it goes. Something is not working right with this. I think, I'll tell you what, I think we're missing a spring here. I'm not sure why this thing okay well I'm determined to put that safety switch back on let me pause the camera and look around here okay we figured uh, what was going on there's a spring it fits over this little mounting stud right here whatever you want to call it and this straight part of spring goes behind that and this hooks around goes underneath this little safety trigger and wraps around it and that way you can't pull your trigger you know, I got my camera off here again this will work better when it's all together there we go that way as you can see 
I can't push my trigger unless holding that. And I think that will work a lot better once I put get the case bolted together. But now we're going to try to put it together. But that's why that wasn't working right. So now I get to fish all these lines in again. Make sure that's lined up. And that wire is determined to get pinched again. Now hook in the slot. Check my fuel lines. Again. And I think they're in a little slot so they don't get pinched. And it looks like everything's going to turn out. Pull together here. Another thing to make it easier on yourself, always remember to leave your oil cap off. Because with this on, that won't fit through that hole. See where that old epoxy there? That's where I tried to fix my leaking tank that I had a long time ago. It didn't work, so enough of that story. But um, yeah, we just gotta put all our screws in it now. Hopefully, we've got everything. Let's look around and make sure I didn't forget anything. I don't think I did. We got several screws that hold it all together here and these are the uh had the wood screw type threads because they thread into the plastic get a few of them started i'm not going to tighten them on until i get them all started one of them i probably should have done it first maybe it'll go together easier easier this time but when i already had it together Last night, this one right here was really stubborn to uh, get lined up with the thread. So I probably should have done it first because that's what I ended up doing. But let's see if it's. It feels like. It feels like that one bit. Yeah, it's one again. It's it tuck thread. Good deal. And we got one right here. If you remember, I said you could either use a Torx bit or they also have slots for a flathead. I take this big long screwdriver to clear this handle. It doesn't have to be as long as this one, but get it to where it falls down there and where it should. And because that handle gets in the way of the shorter screwdriver. See what I'm saying? That just kind of puts it at an angle there. And we got that one snug down. Snug this one down now. Put the rest of them. After I get all these tightened up before I go any further, make sure everything works. Make sure the flywheel turns. Make sure. that the trigger works and all that. Try to have everything ready so that the video is short as possible but I can still show you everything. Okay, flywheel still turns. Trigger works. Doesn't, can't pull it unless I push the little safety thing. Everything's looking good. I think I hooked up my fuel lines. They're both hooked to the primer bulb. Everything looks like it's down in a tank like it should be. So I'm going to go ahead and put my cap on so I don't get any dirt in it. Put this in there. Now, before, before I put the starter recoil on, I want to go ahead and get my clutch on. And this is pretty much a this is a pretty easy deal here. All it, all it is is um, that little plate goes in there. There's your clutch, goes like that. Springs pointing outward, and you just put. And this also has some needle bearings in there. I don't have to fool with that because they're already in it. This is the new sprocket. But that goes like that. This goes facing this way.
Well, something's not looking right. Thought that's how I had it. That's not it. <laughs> Hang on, okay? Could have sworn. Okay, there you go. It's like a guard. There you go. It goes like that. I was telling you wrong. Told you I'd forget something, even though I just took it apart like a half hour ago now. Now, remember on this one, <coughs> it's a left-handed thread, meaning to tighten it, you turn it to the left. And as you can see, that's screwing on down there. And to loosen it, you turn it to the right. Now these threads got a little messed up, so that's how far I can finger tighten it. And now we're going to use the rope again. I kind of wish I left it in there. Put the rope down in our piston. In our piston hole, rather. Trying to be stubborn, don't want to go down in there. Okay, now that might be enough. I didn't didn't really shove that much in there. Remember to tighten this left-handed nut, we've got to go to the left. As you can see, you can Get it plenty tight. You don't, you don't really want to crank down too tight on these. That, those are small, fragile threads anyway. I'm probably tightening it more than I should have to. And then we move the piston back a little bit, and the rope comes right out. So I can go ahead and put my spark plug in it. is our little fuel filter which goes right here. Make sure the linkage is working good. Yep, sure is. Goes in there just like that. I've already cleaned it. And here is your little choke lever. It goes to this little plastic piece right here. Hopefully you can see it with the camera way over there. And that just fits right there. And then you also get a cap. It goes over top of your carburetor. As you can see you pull it out, it chokes it completely, and then you get half choke. And that's how it'll be set when after the engine is warmed up. There's that. And then we can put our cover on it. Hopefully everything will still be set like it was and it'll run. I already got my screws in there. Now these take a little bit different screw from the others. I don't know if I can get it off. You can see there's a little bit of a shank there. So these full threaded screws, if you got all your screws out and you can't remember what goes where, remember the, there's only two of them like this on the whole saw. It's got a little, little shaft right there with no threads so that it can slide in and out there. And the threads are kind of tight so your screws usually won't fall out if you remove this plate. And we just do that. Set it right there. Get them both started before you go to tightening anything. Don't be too forceful. Remember you're threading in the plastic here. Choke feels like it's working good. There's full choke, half choke. Nah, that's still working. Now all we got left is our starter recoil. screw stuck in there. We'll do that one first. You, don't, you want to make sure that it um, slides down in those plastic uh, paws I showed you on the flywheel. And make sure you're not forcing it down on top of something and breaking something.
four screws hold it in. Nothing too complicated there. Oops, and there we go. My little Torx bit came out of my screwdriver. What a way to spend a Saturday night, huh? I'll tell you what, the weather here has been cold, dark, and miserable. We've got, we got like a couple inches of snow on the ground. We never get a lot of snow in Kentucky. Heavy snows are kind of rare here. But it's just been a very dreary, cold, depressing day. So it's good to get out and do stuff like this on a day like that. It's a lot better than sitting around in front of the TV getting depressed because it's too cold to do anything. Get out in your garage if you got heat. If you don't have heat, figure, a way, figure out a way to get some heat in there that you can afford. I got an oil furnace in here myself and I like it a lot. But see this oil furnace used to be in the house and I'm kind of wishing it still was in the house because my heat pump went out. And I mentioned that well with my when I was doing my pole install video. I decided I was going to start uh, burning more firewood because right now I have the electric furnace only, which works, but it's still wired for the heat pump, so the heating element comes on and warms up to whatever temperature your thermostat is set at. Then it kicks off, and then the fan only will kick on until it's 5 degrees below what you got set on and blows cold air. Then finally, heating elements kick on again. I like my wood stove. It, Actually, when I feed that wood stove, I can uh, get by in really cold, 10 degree weather without even using my furnace at all. But, okay, we got that. Make sure that is shut off. It is. And all we got left now, got our chain, which is very dull. We're going to have to sharpen it. I uh, bought me a chain sharpening kit. All it is is a file. I'll show you that in a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself here. But uh, I touched up the one on my pole, and was, which wasn't too awful dull. And uh, I noticed a big improvement by using that. I thought about getting an electric one later. But anyway, there's a little trick to getting this chain on without having to remove your muffler or your sprocket. you got to go in this way, all the way up against the saw, turn it, and kind of get it behind that sprocket. And... Sharp side of the teeth facing the front of the saw. It's very easy to get in a hurry and put it on backwards, as goofy as that sounds. And here's our adjustment screw, which moves the blade in and out. There is a little, let's see if you can see, I'm just, that's why I'm looking at the camera, make sure I am showing it in the view of the camera lens. There's a little tab right there. That fits in either one of these holes. You can actually you can put this on upside down and it'll work. It would just look goofy. But this little tab right here that this adjustment screw moves in and out goes in that hole. And let me adjust it. I don't need this really long screwdriver right now, but I will later. Let me adjust it. To the shortest setting. That way I can get my chain on it. The shortest setting would be the tab going all the way back. Don't go too far because it will come off that screw and fall out. And, and that can be kind of annoying to get back on. And what I'll do is I'll go ahead and get that in there. And where that tab and the chain's kind of binding up here. There we go. And there's also a little tab right there that this slot goes in. Keeps your helps keep your blade steady. And then you carefully get your chain there. Okay. Just kind of leave that in that rail there. And before I put my cover on it, I always like to. Um, Adjust that out by turning. You, you tighten your chain by turning by turning your screw in. And I tried to just see how that bars. I don't know if you can see it yet or not. My arm's in the way. No, you can't see it. Okay. 
big long screwdriver. It's kind of kind of awkward, but it's nice because it, it extends past the blade and you can put it straight. It's just a flathead screw, which I don't really like because flathead screws are easy to round the head off. Okay, now I don't have it as tight as it should be, but at least I got it to where my chain will hopefully stay on when I put my cover on. And I'll show you why I'm doing it that way. Anyway, where is my cover for my brake? Here it is, right here. Okay, here's how your brake works. It's pretty simple. Move it forward. This little band tightens around that clutch sprocket. Move it back. And this one works pretty well, so we'll leave it on there. If you noticed on my Poland, it doesn't have a chain brake on it. It came out with one, but um, it was locking up, causing the saw to not want to turn the blade, so I took it off. And let's see, we already got our screws right here. Get two screws, one up here and one on the bottom. Again, be careful not to strip them out. They're kind of fragile. Don't want to have to repair them with epoxy. There we go. Get that in there. Hold there. I don't know how long this video is going to be, but I wanted to show the whole assembly of it. And you got two right hand threaded nuts that go right here. And that's what kind of clamps your blade down. And that takes a 7 16 socket, or you can buy a little tool to keep in your case. At one time I probably had that. And what I do before I tighten the chain, I kind of hand tighten those and then back them off a little bit. So the blade's not flopping around too loose. And then go back to our adjustment screw. Turn your screw in until your chain is as tight as you want it to be. There we go. That's about right. And then you can go ahead and use a little leverage to get those good and tight. And that's pretty much all this in. I got two more screws I gotta put in. There's so here we go. take it apart. You also have two screws. To hold your handle together, it attaches your handle to the case. The handle just kind of slides in a slot right there. And this thing's together. We're going to put some gas and oil in it. Make sure it starts. I think I'm going to go ahead and sharpen that blade. As a matter of fact, I will show you how you're supposed to do that. And that one's wanting to be stripped out. If it vibrates out, I'll have to fix that hole with some kind of epoxy. I don't like that plastic. Okay, now I'm going to move the camera to show it because I like to put my uh, bar in a vise so it stays steady. I'm going to show you how you're supposed to sharpen these chains. Okay, I'm, I've already uh, done some sharpening on the chain. I'm just going to do a quick little go over of that, show you how that Oh, you're supposed to do it. Now, you, I bought this gauge. Uh, I used it on my other polling, and it worked pretty good. The uh, good thing about this gauge is you can keep your angle the same. You use, so you got a 30 degree angle on this end, and you got a 25 on this end, depending on which chain you got, I guess. It looks like mine is the 25, so I've been using that. And it's got that little round file that fits in this fixture. And you can just put it in there and like I said line up make that line there parallel with your blade just so you keep your angle the same and you just count how many times that you cut I'm not pushing very hard because I already sharpened these and then flip it do the other one one two you notice your teeth are opposite each other this one angles that away cutting edge right here this one's got a cutting edge over here and they switch back and forth and and the file works a lot smoother if you go in this direction. Look just like that. And you count how many times you take a cut. And you do the same for each one. Now, something else that uh, I learned off of YouTube. 
uh, you get this is they have this little gauge here and it says 23 thousandths of an inch which means this step from here to here is 23 thousandths and these little runners here I forgot what you name call this part of the blade it's these do not cut uh, this determines the depth of your cut or the thickness of your wood chip is what it does this rides on a wood but this blade needs to be above that but not too far above it so it's taking such a big chip that your saw doesn't have enough power to cut it and but but when, every time you sharpen this these teeth get a little smaller and, and a lot of times you can have sharp blades but it won't cut worth a darn because these are up too high of course they'll be above the blade and you know what's going to happen these are just going to rub and these won't be cutting anything and you're just going to be making dust instead of chips now they give you this little file with this it it cuts okay but I like to use something a little coarser it just takes them off and what you do is you just make sure these runners are even or level with your gauge and you go down to each and every one lay this part on top of the teeth make sure this step isn't up on your teeth and just file those down at level with your gauge okay YouTube I was gonna do uh, a cold start on this but um, I started taping it and it was being really stubborn to start this thing is um, really easy to flood there's kind of a trick to starting it but right now it's already warm but I just turn the ignition on, of course. enough of that in there I don't want to get carbon monoxide poisoned out garage is all closed up but um, I will try out that blade tomorrow morning it's dark outside now if you can see through that window dark and cold but um there you go we took a whole box full of parts and uh, turned it into a saw and it seems to run pretty good a little rich. I think I got a little too much too much oil in my mixture there. I seen a little bit of oil coming out of the muffler. But um, actually, it's not a bad looking little saw. Bought this thing in either '88 or '90. It was it was somewhere between 1988 and 1990. Uh, I can't remember the exact year I bought it, but it's it was at least uh, at the latest I bought it was in like 1990. So a fairly old saw, even though it's modern plastic made but uh, okay my blades getting a little oil I was trying to see if I was getting any oil on it looks like it's starting to spray but um, yeah well I tried I'm going to try to do some uh, wood cutting tomorrow I don't think I'll film on any of that we might film some wood cutting later on but uh, I do have another one more chainsaw video to show you we're not going to do any work in the next one but I want to show you a, a little something I bought which is kind of cool it's an old antique David Bradley saw so for, for you people who are into old chainsaws you might find that interesting and I'll do a size comparison between this my Poland and the uh, David Bradley okay thanks for watching